So good to hear Rami's testimony tonight. I couldn't help thinking as he shared about his journey in coming to Christ about how odd it was that our lives had connected. I grew up in Owensboro, Kentucky, a small western Kentucky town. Owensboro was a bit like the Shire, <laughs> a beautiful place, a little protected, a little provincial. If you had asked me back in Owensboro what I thought about the Arab people, not, not that anyone ever did that, of course, but, but just say someone had asked that, I would have said, well, all Arabs are Muslims. All Arabs own guns, and all Arabs would probably happily kill Americans. That was kind of my TV view. I left Owensboro many years ago, never to return. And years later, found myself directing a program in Tunisia, in North Africa, in kind of the site of the so-called Arab Spring. We placed students in Muslim homes, students that were studying English and wanted to have an English-speaking uh, student to speak with and develop their colloquial English skills. It was a marvelous time. Great friendship was developed. Uh, and uh, it was on that program I discovered the Arab view of Americans, which was all Americans were Christians, all Americans own guns, and all Americans would happily kill Arabs. It was on that program that I met Hatem. Hatem was, Hatem was just a delightful student at the University of Tunis. He, uh, he was a practical joker. He was constantly playing tricks on the students. He was constantly uh, involving himself in competition. So uh, one, one day, Hatem took us out to the, uh, the Muslim beach where we could get away from kind of the decadent European beaches and, and uh, just have fun with Arab families. And I spied a, a, a sandbar. Maybe it was about, oh, about 100 yards off the shore. Beautiful blue Mediterranean sea. We're out splashing around. And I, I say, come on, Hatem, I'm going to race you out to the sandbar. So he said, no, no, I must go take a cigarette. I said, okay, well, you go on back. Uh, he swims back there. Well, I, I just leisurely start swimming out to the sandbar. But then I see Hatem has dove under the water under me, and he's trying to beat me out to the sandbar. This is my chance. I shadow him on top. He comes up directly in front of me. I grab him in a perfect chokehold, take him down, bloosh, bring him back up. I he's sputtering. I'm laughing. I take him down again for good measure. Kaboosh. I bring him back up. I spin him around and it's not hot him. <laughs> it is a very frightened Tunisian who knows that an American has come to kill him personally. <laughs> what do you say? I'm so sorry. He doesn't speak English. He's backing up like this. I'm following him to the beach. <laughs> it was then I had sort of an out-of-body experience when I looked up and realized his entire extended Muslim Arab family is gathering on the beach. I'm imagining the next morning's headlines about American terrorists killed on Muslim beach. I get up to the shore, and um, I realize these are, these are buff guys now. These are big guys, and uh, they're, they're not mad yet, but I'm in danger. And what I need, of course, what I need at that very moment, at which you know, is I need an ambassador. Here comes Hotham. Hey, what's, what is going on here? I say, Hotham, come here. I grab him by the arm. Listen. I tell Hotham what's happened. Hottam thinks this is so hilarious. Tears are rolling down his cheeks. Fortunately for me and my progeny, <laughs> the family thinks this is so hilarious that tears begin to roll down their cheeks. I'm invited into lunch. 
the big Arab tent. I get shawarmas and hummus and experience great Arab hospitality. Hadam spoke the language. He explained the truth. He made sure I was reconciled and spared certain death. I want to read tonight from 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. This is a passage best known for ambassadorship, but it is so much more. As I read it, notice how gospel-saturated this passage is. I wish I could do it justice. We don't have enough time. This is one of the richest texts, and I certainly feel the poverty of the preacher. But let's start in verse 11, and we'll read it through. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the, to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I have five marks of the ambassador. I'd like to highlight those things as we look at the text. An ambassador's motive in verses 11 through 15. Our understanding of people, verses 16 and 17. Thirdly, our understanding of God's work in the world, verses 18 through 19. Our understanding of our role as Christians in verse 20. And finally, point five, our understanding of Christ's work with the gospel in verse 21. First, our motivation for ambassadorship. John, of course, told us, powerfully this morning about what it means to fear God and the tension that we're in in that. Paul is saying here that when we understand what's at stake, when we understand what God is doing, when we understand judgment, we fear God. Therefore, we persuade people in verse 11. That's the motivation of the ambassador. We, we know what's coming. We know what's down the road. So we persuade people. We set out facts. We answer objections. We help people understand. We talk. We teach. J.I. Packer says that Paul's primary method of evangelism was a teaching method. And Paul says our motivation is different than what people may see. It's not because we're proud in verse 12. It's not because we're crazy in verse 13 though it may look like both. And not only do we fear God, we've concluded something, we've decided something in our mind in verse 14, that Jesus died for all who would repent and come to him, and that his death was for their sake in verse 15. We've concluded, we've decided, we're convinced that sin can be forgiven 
and reconciliation with God is possible through the death of Jesus. And that conclusion leads us to an understanding that we don't live for ourselves. When we persuade, we step out of our safe worlds. We, we don't hide from evangelism. We're committed and motivated and driven to boldness, even seeming craziness because of this amazing love of God. I was on a panel in Australia at a student conference in December. I was in front of a couple thousand students. The question came up, why do you do ministry in the Middle East? It was, it was like, how in the world? Paused, I thought. I didn't want to belabor the obvious. But then I said, because I really believe, I'm really convinced in my mind that this guy really did rise from the dead. I really believe that. You see, it makes, it makes everything make sense. I'm convinced and sometimes that makes us look a little touched, a little crazy. People thought that about Paul in verse 13. They don't know what we know about Jesus, we, especially about his love in verse 14. They don't know that. So, okay, even kind of makes us look crazy to each other, right? I banged my for sale so sign in the front yard of my home on September 12th, the day after 9-11. The day after 9-11. So convinced that re the response to the events of 9-11 were not military but missionary. So convinced that the power of Christ's love could overcome any hatred in the world. But, but to my neighbors who understood I was moving to the Middle East still, thought I was crazy. There was no category. Even Christians. Hey, listen, when you, when you listened to David Platt last, last night, I mean, don't you think he's a little crazy? <laughs> uh, you know, it's just like he's on the edge. And you know why? Because it's true. It's true. The brother is tender-hearted, filled with a crazy love that comes from Jesus for the world. Now, I need to say, some people, of course, use verse 14 and 15 as a proof text for universalism. But I think Warfield is right to say that we have a choice between a high atonement or broad atonement in this text, in verses 14 and 15. And you cannot read Paul's writings or look at his life and do anything but reject universalism. It's a heresy. It makes a mockery of missions and evangelism. It makes a mockery of what Paul gives his whole life for. Paul is certainly not giving a, a universalist sta statement here. But maybe more to the point, to focus on the heresy of universalism here is to miss the point of verse 14 and 15. I've heard a lot of discussions on this verse about universalism or definite atonement or particular, particular redemption. And in one sense, that's okay, except the point of the text is about living for others and not ourself in evangelism. So have at that discussion if you feel like your life is filled with evangelistic opportunities and that you're living out the missionary call well in your life. But don't miss don't miss what Paul is trying to tell us in this text about what it means to be involved in mission, in evangelism, in sharing our faith. It's not about, it's not about that stuff. It's about living for others. It's about our motivation. So in verses 11 through 15, Paul says, we're motivated by the fear of the Lord, the conviction of truth, and the love of Christ. That moves us out in mission, in evangelism, with crazy boldness for others. Point two, this has ramifications for how we view people. Verse 16 and 70, point two. 
once we're motivated correctly, Paul says in verse 16, that ambassadors, therefore, view people correctly. I love what Don mentioned the other night about his father who taught him rightly that whenever you see a therefore, you look and see what it's there for. In this particular text, there's lots of therefores, and he'd be looking a lot. Therefore, he says, we view people correctly. We reject sinful views. We reject racist views. We reject fleshly views of other people. We stop seeing people through TV lenses like I viewed Arabs or Arabs viewed us. Now, this is, a, this is our natural tendency to pe- see people this way. Paul, Paul says we even viewed Jesus this way with worldly eyes. We hear it today. People want to say nice things about Jesus, so they call him a great moral teacher. I live in a place where people say that he was a great prophet. But to, but to talk about Jesus that way actually damns him with faint praise. It cuts the heart out of Christianity. Jesus was divine. He was God incarnate. And anything else less curses Christ. Paul's point is that if we saw Jesus that way, how much more likely are we to see other people that way? Through TV lenses, not through the eyes of God. Now, to view, to view people correctly is a situational challenge. It depends if they're people we like or we don't like. On the, on the one hand, as C.S. Lewis reminded us, there's no such thing as a mere mortal. Everyone has the mark of the divine. Everyone, everyone has been created in the image of God. That's why all people have value and dignity and worth. So ambassadors check the tendency to hate those we don't like. We slay that in our lives. At the same time, Christians understand, ambassadors understand all people to be sinners. And not just sinners, but without Christ, enemies of God. So ambassadors check the tendency to glorify people that we admire, knowing that every human is fallen and broken and sinful. I like the quote from G.K. Chesterton who said, I don't know why people have problems with the doctrine of total depravity. It's the one doctrine we have empirical data for. Just look at the last 3,000 years of human history. Now, the most important corrective lenses that we can put on is in verse 17, that we understand the potential of what people can become. So it's not just that we have the mark of the divine, or that we're broken and fallen and sinful apart from God. No, it's that we can become new creations in Christ. Fallen enemies of God can become new creations, forgiven, restored, redeemed creations in Christ. And is there any more joy than that? Is there any more joy in life to see new creations happen in the ministry around us, to see people who have come to faith and growing in Christ, those who have shared their testimony, for example, over over the course of this weekend, Nissan and Joanna and Sarah and Victoria and Yuna and Nestron and Rami, to hear their stories of faith, all new creations in Christ. Sometimes as they were sharing over the course of this weekend, I felt like a nervous parent at a piano recital. They're like my children in the faith, hearing about their great, great salvation. You know how how easy it would have been for guys who were on the team like Brian or David to say, there's just too many obstacles in life for me to reach out to someone like these kids. Like Nissen said, middle-aged white guys hanging around in the food court. How easy it would have been to decide, "I, I... I don't have anything to offer these guys. They're just, they're students. I'm, I'm old. I don't know what to do with those. How easy it would have been. What about you? Do, you? do you have people in your life you believe that about? You think they'll never come to Christ. Maybe a family member someone you love dearly that's really close to you? Do you think they're too sinful, too hard-hearted, too isolated, too distant? Perhaps, perhaps they look like they have everything they need. 
Maybe, maybe you know some non-Christian whose life seems better than yours. You're tempted to believe that they don't need God. Don't believe it for a minute. People the world around need Jesus because he offers something that they can't have on their own. They cannot become new creations. Notice how large the scope of this as well in verse 19. This is point three, how we view the world. It's not just how ambassadors are motivated or how we view people. It's about how ambassadors view the world. Paul says in verse 19 that God is reconciling the world. It's a global message. It goes out to all the world. There's a tendency to think that the message is just for small parts of the world. I live in a land where Jesus, of course, is not seen as the Son of God. Now, many Muslims will honor Jesus more than most of the Western world. But as I've mentioned, to deny Jesus as divine is to cut the heart out of Christianity. My house sits in between three mosques, loud mosques, five times a day. We hear the avalanche of misinformation that God has no partners. And I'm frankly at times tempted to despair as I think about the hardening of heart that the announcement that happens five times a day, which is essentially a statement that God does not have a son. But there are no barriers to God. There are no barriers to God. And this gospel is going out throughout the world. It's our great hope that you would have eyes to see the joy of gospel ministry and how our sovereign Lord is at work around the world. Nestoron, who get, shared her testimony, Nestoron from Iran, who shared her testimony on the way out this uh, afternoon, said it, it was a lot scarier to speak to you guys in English than it was to go to jail. <laughs> But she mentioned I was going to tell a little more of her story. It's a, it's a harder thing to do in English, and she wanted me to do this. Nestoron was about 17. She was in Tehran. She was a good Muslim girl. She was in the shower. She heard a voice, and the voice said, I'm going to wash you of your sin. She didn't know what that was. So, being a good Muslim girl, she went to the mosque the next day and went to her imam and said, I heard a voice. And the voice said, he was going to wash me of my sin. Who was that? And the imam said, that was Jesus. He's the only prophet that talks that way. And Nestron said, thank you, and she went home. The same day, in the Netherlands, Nestron's sister, who is a secret believer in the Netherlands, her family did not know that she had come to faith, goes to church, and a woman comes up to her and says, this is very strange for me. I had a dream last night. I never have dreams. I never remember my dreams. But this dream was so real and so vivid, I need to talk to you about it. I dreamed that you were sitting on a bed with two women, and I think you were telling them about Jesus. And I think you need to go home to Tehran. Nestoron's sister, whose name is Nestorine, said, I, I don't have any money. I, I can't go home. And she said, no, you don't understand. The, the dream was so real. We've already bought the ticket for you. Nestorine gets on the plane. She flies home. She goes home. She doesn't know where to go. Knocks on the door. Nestoron and her mother answer the door. Two women. They go sit on the bed, just like in the dream. Nestorine says, I don't know why I'm here. But Nestoron says, no, Jesus has spoken to me. You're here to tell me the, about who Jesus is. And so she does. And Nestoron and her mother come to faith. So, so started an amazing journey for Nestoron, her husband, Yuna, in ministry. 
I suppose there's many of you who find that outside of your experience or your theology even. But remember, no one patted Nestor on, on the back for seeing a vision. It started a life of humiliation, persecution, jail, deportation. For their brave faith, you heard Yuna speak of his time in jail in Iran where they expected to die. They were arrested in the same way as their pastor had been arrested. Yuna said the hardest thing he's ever done in life is watch his wife under interrogation. And yet, he said, she was so brave with the gospel. I just, I just want to point out, there are no barriers to God. Take heart. Do you, do you see people from other faith backgrounds and think that you can't get to them? Do you see people that seem to have it all together and you lose hope? Don't. Don't lose heart. God, according to Paul, has given us this ministry, which is point four, our role. Paul, Paul is not just making a case for an ambassador's motivation or how an ambassador's view people or how ambassadors view the world. He's talking about how we see ourselves. So he says in verse 18 and again in 19 and 20 that we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. That's an amazing thought. Paul, Paul didn't come up with this ambassadorship image by accident. It's an image to make sure we understand our role. Ambassadors exist to deliver a message. That's what they're for. So according to Paul, when you sit down with a friend or colleague or fellow student, a neighbor over a cup of coffee, and somehow a spiritual topic comes up, spiritual topics often come up. There's that divine setup, right? I'm always irritated with God that he doesn't warn me beforehand about these things. There's that sense that it's coming at you. And when that happens, when you kind of screw up your courage, take that step. I didn't know you were interested in spiritual things. Tell me about that. You know, whatever it is, Think about this, brothers and sisters, that there from the very throne of God stretches a cable that somehow comes from the throne of God through you right to that person. That you represent the foreign power of the kingdom of God. You all don't look impressed with that. Listen. Listen to that. You represent the foreign power of the kingdom of God. It doesn't feel that way, but it's true. We have this ministry. So if ambassadors are representatives of the foreign power of the kingdom of God, that we exist to deliver a message, we need to get the message right. Ambassadors we're not at liberty to change the message. We don't nice up the message. We deliver it as given. So we persuade. We don't manipulate. We persuade. We talk. We explain things. Listen, ambassadors don't, <laughs> ambassadors don't leave the message undelivered. You don't get the message and leave it in your sock drawer. Don't put it there. And by the way, ambassadors by definition don't live at home just by definition. They are wanderers in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that you all need to move and come to Dubai, though you're welcome. We would love to have you. It means that you don't make the world your home. You don't get comfortable here. Christians should always be a little bit uneasy with the, the world and living here. Think about that. Now, at this point in the text, model, Paul models what we say. It's a bit of a tricky verse in, in the second half of verse 20. It, it, it can sound on first reading like Paul is calling the Corinthians to be reconciled to God. 
And they certainly had problems. But as John mentioned this morning, he's speaking to Christians for all their problems. They were Christians. No, Paul is repeating the message that we shout out, the message we shout out to the world, which is we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, I, I want to be quick to say this is not something we only say. It's mostly what we do. We mostly say a message. But it should come out of all of our life. The gospel should flow out in everything that you do. Not just something, not something you do every now and then on someone. I, mean, I think there was a time in my life when I felt like I, you know, evangelism was something I did to someone. And so I'd, I'd kind of get this head of steam you know, up, and then I'd evangelize and say, oh, I'm so sorry I evangelized on you. I, I, I didn't like it. They didn't like it. I think, it's, I think it's more that we want to live and eat and breathe the gospel, that it's everything we are, so that when, when we're talking with people, the gospel comes out. It just comes out naturally because that's who we are. We so live in the gospel. I love what Tim Keller says about this, that the gospel is not just the ABCs. It's not just what gets us saved. It's the A to Z of the Christian life. It's the hub of the Christian life that we go in and out of. We order our lives around the gospel so that everything we do, whether it's an elder meeting, whether it's a, whether it's a, a time with our children, whether it's uh, meeting people in the neighborhood at work, it's all related to the gospel. Does that make sense? I, I long for Christians to have a fully orbed understanding of how to live out the gospel. Let me, let me give you an illustration of this. Um, Early, early on in the student ministry in Dubai, the, as the students began to, uh, John, as John Stott says, gossip the gospel with others, we realized, wow, this is, this is really happening. We, never, we, we didn't know, we thought we might go to the Middle East and never have a student movement at all. We, we, we thought we'd just go to labor there for 40 years and be faithful and come home. And maybe, you know, we could tell some great stories about being in the desert, but it actually happened. You know, hundreds of students started forming fellowships. And, got, and in the midst of that, I decided we needed to have some leadership training. And um, so let's get all our leaders together, and we'll bring them in, and we'll do leadership training. And I, I don't know what I was thinking, really. But anyhow, the students were excited to do that. Nissen was still a student. Joanna was there, and they brought lots of the student leaders, all brand-new baby Christians, and, um, and I noticed they were in my living room, and there's a kill, a kill sitting there in the, this leadership gathering. I go over to Nissen, Nissen, come here. And look, a kill is a Hindu. What's he doing here? Oh, well, he just wanted to come. He thought it would look good on his resume to have some leadership training. <laughs> and um, actually, that was not true. That was not even true. Uh, he was there because there was the, this cute girl named Shubnita <laughs> there. But anyhow, how long have I been involved in student ministry? I should have figured that out, right? I didn't even. So um, I said, well, listen, it, he's a Hindu. He really can't come to this. You know, it's, it's fine. There's other things he can come to. You tell him not to come anymore. Nissen said, okay, which means no. <laughs> and uh, Akil kept coming faithfully. <laughs> and um, he was actually more faithful than some of the other Christian students. So finally, I, I said, I need to take things into my own hand. I'm going to talk to Akil. I went up to Akil. He's a really nice guy. I said, Akil, listen, um, I need to talk to you about something. He goes, oh, I, I got something I want to talk to you about. I said, okay, you go first. He said, I've become a Christian. <laughs> and I said, you did? And he said, yeah. I said, how'd that happen? He said, well, I, I thought this was going to be something like I put on my resume or something, you know, but, but you guys kept talking about the gospel. And every time we got together, it was all about, about reconciliation and about what it meant to follow Christ and how the gospel had bearing on our leadership. And I realized I needed to repent of my sin and put my trust and faith in Christ. And that's what I did. He said, what do you want to talk to me about? <laughs> and I said, um, nothing. <laughs> Went back to Nissan. I said, Nissan, okay, keep inviting the Hindus to leadership. I mean, in other words, it's, it was a setting where in many contexts it would have been very easy to just assume the gospel, to just, hey, by the way, 
this is, this is cute. I'll step away from the pulpit. Um, <laughs> Akil really wooed Shabnita, and they got married. Um, and faithfully followed Christ against huge opposition from his family. He was baptized against their wishes and threats, and they were married in a Christian wedding, and they are attending the United Christian Church of Dubai. So he's just, just parenthetically sweet. Listen, it needs to come out of us. Some of you here tonight may not know about this reconciliation with God. You've wandered in with a friend, maybe like a kill. You're just listening in. I want to talk to you for just a second. This is a message for you. See yourself through God's eyes. You're both divinely created and yet cut off from God. The Bible says because of your sin, unforgiven sin, you're in rebellion. You may not feel like a rebel, but you are if you have never been born again. Understand your potential. You can be reconciled to a loving God, our Father, who sent His Son to pay the penalty for your sin on the cross so that you could be forgiven of sin, your darkest, deepest sin, the sin that separates you from God. What's required of you is not to claw your way back into God's favor, but simply turn from sin, especially the sin of unbelief, and to turn to Christ with complete trust and faith. That's the message we shout out. I'm like Paul. Be reconciled to God because you can be. You can be forgiven. Which brings us to our last point, point five. Our understanding of God's work in the message of the gospel, verse 21. So we've seen that ambassadors are motivated in love for all people around the world with a clear understanding of our role as ambassadors. We do that with an understanding of what Jesus has done in the gospel. Verse 21 bears repeating. Verse 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, much ink has been spilled on verse 21. It contains two huge theological ideas, imputed righteousness and substitutionary atonement, all in 24 words. These 24 words are the heart of the gospel. It's a behind-the-scenes look at what God did on the cross. Imputed righteousness means a righteousness that doesn't come from inside of you. It's given. Or in other words, our righteousness, contrary to most religions of the world, come to us from God. It's not self-righteousness. We hate self-righteousness anyhow. It's a God-given righteousness, wherein is great love. God took the sins of all who would repent and believe and put them on his perfect, sinless son that we might be forgiven by God. Paul says that Jesus became sin. He didn't sin. He wasn't a sinner. He became sin. Sin was imputed into Jesus. It was the cup of wrath. And then God takes all who will repent and believe in Jesus and clothes us in Christ's righteousness, that we're united in Christ so that we stand before God as both forgiven and righteous. That's imputed righteousness. I love what John MacArthur said said in summary of the meaning of verse 21, on the cross, God treated Christ as if he had committed all the sins of every sinner who would ever believe so that he would treat every believer as if they had lived Christ's perfect life. Oh, praise God for that. Well, just as imputed righteousness is a righteousness that comes from outside of us into us, substitutionary Atonement comes from outside of ourselves, too. To atone for sin means to pay for sin. 
Much of the world also thinks that all of that is about what we do ourselves. But substitutionary atonement is God atoning for you so that all the sacrifices of the Old Testament pointed to the death of Jesus and his sacrifice. God was preparing the world to understand what he would do on the cross, what he describes here in verse 21. 